Good evening. Good evening. We thank each and every one of you and greetings to each and every one. Greetings to St. John Free Will Baptist Church's Bible Enrichment on the behalf of our pastor, William F. Hudson Jr. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank each and every one of you that is viewing on tonight, whichever platform you're viewing from. We thank God for you on tonight. Tonight's lesson will be on the last of the seven churches. Um, you, if you notice, we've been um, talking about the different churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. And tonight's churches is the church is the Laodicean church, the church at Laodicea. Um, this church is, is known as the lukewarm church. So as we get ready to prepare, tonight's text will be coming from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And our topic tonight is taste tests. And while you're gathering your thoughts together, let us get in the mode and stance of prayer. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you for just bringing us to your Bible enrichment one more time. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your generosity. We just thank you for being God and being God alone. And on this day, we ask that you would continue to to breathe fresh anointing, fresh wind, fresh fire on us like never before. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you continue to, to enrich our spirits as we delve in and dive into your word on tonight, rightly dividing your word of truth. Lord, we bind anything that's not like you, anything that would hinder your word from going to your people. Lord, I ask right now that you would anoint me afresh so that I might speak to your people with clarity, take all tiredness and weakness, anything that's not like you, that would hinder me from giving your word fully to your people on tonight. I bind it right now in the name of Jesus and I loose your authority and your anointing and greater is he as in me than he that is in the world. So I thank you right now for covering me and keeping me and even those that are watching, Lord, cover and keep them in their homes as they're watching, Lord, and they're seeking to do your work, seeking to do your will, seeking to do more for the kingdom. And Lord, right now we continue to pray for our pastor. We ask right now that you continue to encourage his heart and his spirit. We pray for his wife and his children, God. We continue to pray for all families represented. We ask right now that you continue to touch those family that, that have lost families that have lost loved ones and that might be bereaving and have heavy hearts. We ask right now that you would send your comforting angels to minister to their soul and their spirit. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Again, welcome. Greetings to each and every one of you on tonight. Um, our text, again, is coming from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And I'm going to read it in your hearing. And the topic on tonight is taste test. Taste test. Let's go there. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I, sh I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. So you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears, let them hear. That's us. That's speaking to us. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, some introduction and background to Laodicea. Laodicea 
And this culminates with verse 14. Laodicea was the wealthiest of the seven cities known for its banking industry. Banking, if you know banking, banking means money. Banking is prosperity. Manufacturer of wool and a medical school that produced eye salve. They, they had a medical school that produced their own eye salve. But, but this city was all, always had a problem, a problem with this water supply. At one time, an aqueduct was built to bring water to the city. It was neither hot nor refreshingly cool, only lukewarm. The church had become as bland as tepid water that came into the city. The church had come so had come so lukewarm in their faith until it was likened to the lukewarmness of their water supply. That's what they're talking about when they're talking about lukewarm, the lukewarmness of the water supply that he's likening it, likening the Christians uh, faith to that. That it and and the and it made Christ nauseous, and he wanted to vomit, um, spit them out of his mouth. That's what that meant. So tonight's lesson objective is to do a personal temperature check, a per, a personal a personal um, taste test, not t not temperature test check, a personal taste test to make sure that we're we're tasting one thing and not the other thing that, that we're, we're not favoring, we're, we're, we're not in the middle, but, but we're favoring either God or, or, or man or, or the enemy. We're not struggling between two opinions, um, making sure that we're with Christ and not against Christ. We either have, we have, we either have faith or we don't have faith. That's what tonight's objective is. I hope that made sense. So in the natural, if we're talking about taste and we're referencing taste, in the natural, we have some sense, some, an awesome sense of taste. And thank God for the awesome sense of taste. We have the ability to savor something. That means to fully take in its content and really taste it and understand the value of it. The ability to tell if something is too hot, we have that, that mechanism within our taste buds to, we, to, to see if something's too cold or just warmed over, which is lukewarm. When we lose this ability, when we lose our ability to taste, when we lose our ability to savor and to take in the goodness of something, um, then things will taste bland or even have no taste at all. And you can eventually, if you don't have a taste for anything, you'll lose your appetite. You'll even lose your your brain will 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 have a mechanism that 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 reacts to well, you know, she can't taste it, so she's obviously not hungry. And then you lose your hunger if you can't taste. So we have to do a taste test. We don't want our hunger to stop. And so, and then when you lose your appetite and you're not hungry, you starve and ultimately die. Now let's flip that over as the case in the natural, um, in the spiritual. We have the ability to hear the word. We have the ability to listen to the word. That's another sense. Tasting it, digest it spiritually. We, we digest it, but if we close our ears and if we don't take it in and digest it, and live in our own self-sufficiency, which this church did, we lose our Christian flavor. We become bland. We become tasteless. We become a repugnant taste in the mouth of Christ. And notice that this text says about to, about to spit them out. He doesn't say spit them out. He says about to spit them out. It means there is an opportunity for change. And such is the case is it, it, that it is an opportunity to change for this church. It is an opportunity to change for change for us because we are a part of the Christian church. He is giving a chance, a second chance. He gives chances, more than second chances. He gives chances over and over again, and he does it so graciously for us. So let us continue to look at the text and break it down. I've already discussed really verse 14 for you when I gave the background of, um, of the church and, and what Laodicea church is. And, and these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, Talking about Christ, also talking about Christ, okay? 
Okay, these are the words of the amen because Christ it, it, it said it's finished. When he said it's finished, it's finished. So as he's talking, he's speaking to this church. He's talking to the angel. Remember, the angel of the churches is the pastor or the current leader or of, of that church. So verses 15 through 16 says, I know we, we've read those. We've, we've read those. So Christ knew the deeds of the church. They were neither hot nor cold. He had nothing good to say at the outset, like he had other churches. You remember, um, let's let's go back and, and just brief one of the uh, churches real quick. Um, let's go to Thyatira. He first says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service. And I'm in verse 19 of chapter 2, verse 19. Um, he says, uh, I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. That's an accolade he gave. That's an accolade he gave to the church. And then in verse 20 of that same chapter, he said, nevertheless, I have this against you. But if you go back to Laodicea, where we are now, he, 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 he gives the backdrop of who he's speaking to. And then when you get the verse 10, immediately he say, I, he says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. He immediately goes into discipline mode. That's what he's doing here. He's immediately going into discipline mode. He's immediately telling them the urgency of what he needs them to wake up and see. How you're actually doing. The taste test. He's telling them what their taste is like. Okay. He's not calling them that. He's saying that's what it's like. <clears throat> this is a com concern. He wouldn't have addressed the church if it wasn't a concern. When, um, when, when, when a person is concerned about you and concerned about your well-being, they will address you and tell you. And if they have to use tough words and tough love, then so be it. But they're, they're telling you that so that you can hear what the spirit is saying to what, what they're trying to get through to you. And it's not to harm you, but to help you. So as we look at this church, as we continue to look at the lifestyle and the people of this church, they were so prosperous materially and had it all together seemingly on the outside. But their souls were su suffering because they got comfortable in self-righteousness and self-sufficiency in their own gain of getting things. They felt they, they forgot that, that, that the things that they were able to get was not from their strength, but from the strength of God. So let's look at what lukewarm even means. I want to, uh, I took an excerpt from BibleStudyTools.com and I thought that was very, very um, profound. Um, and it, it actually co collaborated with uh, the Merriam-Webster -Web Dictionary. It says, um, it defines lukewarm as moderately warm or tepid. Moderately warm or tepid. It's not even completely warm. Lacking conviction or half-hearted. That means your heart, it, it can also mean that your whole heart is not into something. Or lacking conviction means you can do something and not have a conviction. You can do something and not even worry about the consequences. The synonyms for the word are also revealing. The, uh, the synonyms, the things that are like lukewarm or dull, apathetic means you just don't care, and being moderate. You're just right there in the middle. You, you're not high or you're not low. You, you, you're just right there in the middle, moderate. Anything... You know, you, you don't see anything. You don't have a, a you don't have a say against or, or you don't have a say for you. You just right there in the middle. OK. It, you, you, and even if you're listening to a conversation like it was illustrated in the sermon from Sunday. And even if you don't say anything, you're just as as guilty as saying it, even if you agree to it. If even if you don't say anything because because you didn't say anything for it or against it. So when our faith can be described this way, it means a kind of angst or doldrum has set into our spirit about the things of God. We don't feel like and I'm still reading from the um, from the Bible study tools. Um, we don't feel such an eagerness to be in his word 
or look forward as much to fellowship with our fa- our church family. Our prayer fi- prayer time can feel stale and routine, and we lose our passion for obeying God's laws. Being lukewarm in our faith is a red flag, signaling that our hearts are not where they should be. In fact, God makes a strong statement about those who go down this path in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 30, verse, I'm sorry, 29, 13. That's our very first reference. The Lord says, and he's talking about the children of Israel, of course. The, uh, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. You know, they speak it and their lips are uttering words and they come near to me and they come, they come through my door. They, they, they're in the atmosphere and in the realm with me, but their worship of me is based merely on human rules they have been taught. It's something that's ritualist, ritualistic. It becomes ritualistic and it just goes back to that statement of being lukewarm that, you know, that it, it's, it's stale and it's routine. Something that's stale means that it has sat there and it's become stagnant and there's been a, 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 a vulgar uh, smell that comes from it. And then something that's routine is something that you just do over and over. And then and as you do that, you lose passion because immediately, sometimes, sometimes not all the time, sometimes we forget God. We, we start doing things that, that relate more to the pattern of the world versus what, what God says. And we lose our passion for obeying God's laws. And then we become lukewarm because we, we're so much like the world, there's no real change. And when there's no real change then there, in, in heart, then there's no, there's no real... Um, no real desire to keep moving forward and seeing the fruit of, of your labor that can come out. That's why he said they come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts, their faith, the work is far from me. Their worship of me is based on mere, merely on human rules they have been taught. You know, they've been taught to do something a certain way. And, 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 and that's where the faith is and that's where it stays. When, when the foundation is laid, when the foundation is taught, he's not saying that it's a bad thing, but they're just doing is merely human rules. They have been taught. The patterns of this world, the, the Bible tells us in Romans 12, for it's not to be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our minds. We have to renew our mindsets and the way that we think and the patterns that we do things in so that we're operating in, in life and not stillness. Another reference, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 and this is another reference um, based on verses 15 through 16 of chapter 3 in Revelation because it's, it's showing how, it's, it's showing what lukewarm is and, and what, what, what the attributes of a Christian that is moderate or in that frame of mind looks like. Um, so Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. So this context goes with that text. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, kingdom of heaven, but only the ones, the, the, the ones, excuse me, who do the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out. We did we, Lord, did we not? prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? These are questions that they're going to ask. And then Jesus said, I will plainly, plainly tell them. I will tell them plainly. I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That, that's, that's because they said it with their mouths. 
They said it with their lips. They said it with actions. Their agenda was not to glorify God. Their agenda, they had different agendas. It was not for God's glory. It was either to be seen or we don't know what the agenda could have been, but that's just an example. Sometimes some people do things to be seen. Some people people do things to have a platform. Sometimes some people just have an agenda, period. And it's not God's agenda. Then he said, I, will, I, I never knew you because you didn't truly have a relationship with me. You talked with me with your lips, but your heart was not with me. And he's going to say, away from me, you evildoers. That's what he's going to say to those that really do not worship him in spirit and in truth. He never knew them. There was no true relationship. There was no true meditation uh, with him in the word. There was no, no, no true um, study time with him and, and, and actually culminating and being with him and being in his presence and reading his word and being a, not just a hearer, but a doer of his word. It was not based on truth or fact but fiction and falsity. Let's look at verses 17 and 18 of Revelation chapter 3. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. And I'm reading those verses first. So you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Let's talk about that. This church was so used to self-sufficiency. We stated that earlier. Self-sufficiency meaning doing things on their own, not relying on any other source, but, re- but, but having the, the mindset, you know, that I'm the one doing this. That nobody's helping me. I'm not getting any strength from, from, from anybody else. You know, that's, that's the way they felt. And what they had was based on that as well. And even on their own merit, their own ideals and their own their own knowledge. Yet they were actually blinded by their own foolishness. Sometimes we can get so caught up into doing things on our own or or feeling like we're doing it all by ourselves. And and it's easy to get in that structure and it's easy to get in that mindset. But he's telling them this. um, I'm giving you an opportunity to see through the eyes of the spirit and not the flesh, because that's what he says when he's telling them to, to um, let me go back to his, to, to he's counseling them to buy, buy from him gold, refined and fire, so you can become rich, rich spiritually, rich spiritually and salve so you can see. He wants you to use his salve, not something that you that you uh, that you made and, and thought that you know that it's gonna this could be all all cure to everything. As we must be aware here for us today, we can use this as an example for the church today. We do not have anything that has not come from our Father. He is the giver of every good gift. And every perfect gift. And we must realize that things are temporal. Things, the things that we acquire, the things that we have, even our knowledge is temporal. For we must set our minds on things that are eternal. Those are the things that we need to hold on to. And it's not saying that we're not to enjoy the things and the gifts he has given us. I'm not telling you that. And the word is not telling you that because the word wouldn't have said that he gives good and good gifts and perfect gifts. He's he's not saying that you can't have gifts, that you can't have things, that you can't be blessed with, with materials. He's just saying that we give him glory for the gifts. Realize that it's not about it's not from our sufficiency, from but it's from his sufficiency because we do all we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. He gives us the strength to do the things that we do. So we give him glory and we give him honor and he takes care of those things and he gives us those things. Those who are faithful over little things, he gives much to. So we must realize that. And as we realize that we will grow more in him and also with along with a generous and giving spirit. Titus chapter three, verse five, Titus chapter three, verse five. 
He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. That's what we've been talking about. Not our own self-sufficiency. I wanted to give you some backup, backup scripture from what I was saying. But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, when he renews us, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we, we, he saved us, but it's nothing that we have done. That it's nothing that we have done. Nothing that we have done that has made us even be, become saved or, 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 or be in his righteousness. But it's because of his mercy. He said, but according to his own mercy, mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, the, re, the Holy Spirit renews itself and it regenerates and it refreshes us and it keeps us in right standing with him. The Holy Spirit does. First John chapter two, verse 16. For that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions is not from the father, but is from the world. <laughs> when we take pride over things that gratify it's not from God, it's from the world. But I thought you said that he gives us gifts. I thought you told us that we can enjoy. We can, but it's when we, we become proud, that proudful and, and boastful spirit. And proud can be used in several different contexts. It all depends on the context you're talking about. There can be a proud where you're, where you're humble, you're grateful, and you're happy about something, an achievement. And then there can be a proud where you're arrogant and, and you feel like you're up here when you're really down here. And the Bible tells us not to even think of ourselves above anybody or anything. It tells us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. That's the scripture. That's the word right there. So it's not saying that we can't be proud and, and be, have pride, but it's making sure that we, we're doing it in the right context, that we're doing it from, from God's perspective and not our perspective. So as we realize that we have gained nothing in and on our own merit and we have become complacent at times, we must repent. And he shares this with us. He shares us with, with this when we come that, become that other proud, that arrogant proud, that self-sufficient, that, that, um, that pride that, that keeps us from really embellishing, embellishing in the, the things that he really truly has for, has for us. First John chapter 1 verse 9. This is a key to repentance. This is a key to washing, washing away the, the self-righteousness and coming into his righteousness. If first John chapter one, verse nine, if we confess our sins, if we confess what we've done, the self-righteousness, the arrogance, the pride, if we confess those things, he is faithful. He's faithful and he's just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, all of the pride, all of the self-sufficiency, and all of the arrogance. He, he washes us, and he forgives us, and he purifies us. And, and, as we, and as he forgives us, we have to realize that we must forgive ourselves and move on. We must confess because our righteousness is also a filthy rags. Our righteousness is, is as of filthy rags. Let's look at that reference in Isaiah 64 and 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts, all of the things that we do uh, day by day, all the things that we do um, um, monotonously, the things that we do uh, routinely, the things that we do every single day and, and you know, as, as acts and the works it's all are like, it's a likened to filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sweet, our sins sweep us away. Sin sweeps us away. Sins, sins makes, makes our faith shrivel up. Sin makes us shrivel up and, and be, become unclean and, and useless. He wants us to be useful. He wants us to be used for his kingdom. 
So we have to realize that, you know, it's no, in order for us to be used, he has to clean us up. He has to, to take away the things from us and purify us. That's a part of the buying of the gold. That's the part of him counseling us to take us in his way. And since he is the wonderful counselor, we should take heed to buy into his spiritual refinement so we can become rich his way and not our way. So that we receive healing according to his will and with his resources so we can cl see clearly with the spiritual eye of discernment that type of eye And a reference for that is Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, see, is. Seated at the right hand of God. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And we have been raised with him. So we, have, we, we, we are able to set our hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. We are able. We have that ability. We have that ability to tap into the realm where he is because of who he is. Because it says you have been raised with Christ. This is a part of our taste, our faith and taste, taste, our tasting of faith. Are we there? Do you believe it? And not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. You died. The flesh, the flesh, you, you're still living in this body. But the old you died. And now there's a, a, your new life is hidden with Christ. The attributes and the characteristics of Christ should be in you. That's why it says set your minds on things above. When you set your mind on things above you, your character becomes more and more like Christ and less and less about the world. The, the, you, you, have you ever heard the terminology, you are what you eat? <laughs> I heard that today, and that's good because you 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 it, that, that's so that's so true. If you eat and eat the word, if you study and study the word, the word will start coming out of you. The characteristics will come out of you, and it will it will become not not something that you just do ritualistically and haphazardly. But it, you'll want, to, you'll have the desire, you'll have the burn, you'll have the, the zeal, and even if you're tired in your body, he'll give you that strength to push and do what you need to do for the kingdom because you're setting your mind on things above. But if you set your mind on the world and things that you're not casting your cares on him and your anxieties, you're casting your cares and your, your anxieties with the world. And that's when anxiety comes. That's when fear and depression sets in and those earthly things settle in and overtake your spirit. And that's why it's, it's so profound that we have to make time for God. We have to stay in his word. Even if we're tired, even if we don't feel like it, we have to make time. We have to make time for him because our lives truly depend on it. Our taste truly depends on it. So verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Those he loves, he rebukes and disciplines. If you go back to um, the very first, the very first um, words, he started out, I know your deeds. He started out rebuking, <laughs> but he letting them know that he loved them because he addressed them. He's not going to address them if he didn't really care, but he cares for all of us. And so Christ never said he didn't love this church. And I, I want that to be to be said and to be understood. The actions just made him sick. The faith level made him sick. And he likened it unto their water supply to give an illustration on what make, made him, on how sick it made him or how it made him feel. He actually loved this church. That's why he came to it and was given it an opportunity for, to change and to change genuinely and truly turn and truly repent. A loving parent, as we so know, they chastise their children and will give an explanation. He didn't chastise them and just leave them. He chastised them and gave them an explanation. He gave them the why. He told, he chastised them. He gave them a why and then the opportunity to change. And that's what we do as parents. We, 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 we will chastise our children, we'll discipline them and even rebuke, rebuke things in them. 
and we will we will talk to them and tell them why and then we'll give them the opportunity to ch- to fix the problem if it's a solution that's able to be fixed and that's what he did here for us and that's what he did here for that church as well so um and also is it's a chance for to let them know that he's not there to harm them but to help them and we must let people know that as we uh chastise and as we um rebuke we have to let them know why we just don't rebuke and and just leave people hanging we're supposed to know let them know why and understand and and how we know why is because we're supposed to give them the word and the basis of the word in love okay so let's read Hebrews 12, 4 to 13. And it's rather lengthy because I want you to get the context of what um, the word is saying. Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read that. Hebrews chapter 12. Just bear with me one moment. I actually want to read that in a different Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. And it is, okay, Hebrews 12, 4 through 13. And it's still in the NIV. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. When he rebukes you, don't get upset. Don't don't lose heart. Don't lose your faith because he's chastising you and rebuking you. Well, I don't know if it's the Lord rebuking me or not. I don't know if it's him chastising me or not, you'll know it's him that's chastising you. You will know. Why? Because the Lord is going to discipline you and then there's going to be a blessing on the other side because all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's going to be a chance for you to see and, and, and not to harm you, but to help you. Because the, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And you know that if the enemy comes up against you and, and he, he's going to bring something against you and he'll bring a hardship and he'll put you out there and leave you hanging on a limb and won't give you no explanation. So endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are for what? And this is a question for what children are not disciplined by their father. If you are not disciplined and everyone go undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. Whew. So that means that you're not his if you don't if you don't want to go through the chastisement or he doesn't chastise you or rebuke you. Not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we all have all had human fathers who disciplined us and respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? So as we endure the, the, the rebuke, as we re- endure the hardship that he, that he gives us sometimes, the discipline rather that he gives us, we live. It gives us life because it gives us wisdom. It teaches us how to live and how to thrive and not simply just survive, but to, to, to thrive. They disciplined us for a little, a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. As, he share, as we share, that, that goes back to buying the gold. We're being refined. We're being refined. We're being, we're being tried by the fire through the, through the t- tests and trials and the tribulations. Even if he has to discipline us with it while we're going through it, and it makes us that much closer to his holiness, makes us in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. When you get spanked, when you were a child and you got spanked by your parents, that did not feel good at the time. You know it didn't feel good. Or, or back in when we were in school, we used to get what we call paddlings. We used to get paddlings. And when that, when that hard board hit, hit your behind, it hurt. 
Okay, it hurt, and sometimes it hurt for a few, a few, a few hours, or maybe even a whole rest of a day. But it's painful. It's painful at the time. But they they tell you that you had to be disciplined because you that you didn't obey. You didn't do something that you were supposed to do, and that's what the Lord does. He he he'll have to give us a spiritual spanking, and it don't feel good at the time. But some good is gonna come out of it. That's what he's saying here in this text. So later on, later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. We just talked about that. And peace, righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So you can't, you can't go through life and be trained without any discipline. You have to have some type of discipline. You have to have someone in, in authority over you and not as like, a, like some type of uh, slave master, but someone that's there to structure, show you structure and give you discipline and rebuke you when you're wrong and tell you even when you're when you're right or tell you when you're in error you want that because if you don't have that then your training is in vain so also it says therefore strengthen your feeble knees your feeble arms and weak knees <laughs> make level paths for Therefore, strengthen your feeble arm and knees. Those places that are feeble, those places that are weak in you, he strengthens you as he rebukes and chastises. And he'll make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed so that we may walk in healing, walk in his authority, walk in who he is. We're disabled if we don't take heed to his chastisement. And if we don't take the opportunity to learn and be refined by what he is trying to show us, even in the times of discipline and rebuke. So as it says here in Hebrews 12, verse seven, endure hardship as discipline. Endure it, endure it, endure it. Endure it means stay there, stay there in it, stay there and endure it. Verse 20 and tonight we're kind of we're kind of going through verse twenty, and he's talking here to um we're going to use a reference here. Here I am. Verse twenty says, "Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person." And they with me eat. When you think about someone eating with you, when you're thinking about um, someone knocking on the door and, and, and they, they come in and, and like a, like a guest, um, they come in and this is what he's, this, you can look in your spiritual imagination the, the, you know, they, they stand there at the door and knock and, and they hear his voice and he opens the door and, and he, if they open the door, he'll come in. They, but they have to be willing to open the door and eat and he'll eat with that person. Eat means he'll, he'll feed that person what they need in life so that they can sustain and thrive in life. And then they will eat with him and share their, their thoughts and, and share with him almost in the, in the, if you can look at it in the mode of prayer and worship and praise and being in his presence. Let's look at um, a, a reference. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. This is NIV 2. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that no one, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end, as has just been said today. If you hear his voice, do not today. If you hear his voice, not tomorrow, not next week, 
not not yesterday, but today, in this moment, if you hear his voice, do not harden. Do not turn your ear away from him. Do not turn your soul away from him, your spirit, your soul away from him, as you did in rebellion. Because you know what? It's rebellious to turn away from him. He stands at the door and he's knocking. He's not going to, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way in. You have to open up your heart. The, the Bible tells us if we confess with our mouths and believe with our hearts, we shall be saved. We can confess it, but we have to believe it in our hearts. Our confession is made unto salvation. Our talking to him and allowing him to sup with us. That's what makes us come into the fullness of his joy. Another reference I would like to share with you on tonight is our final reference. And that's uh, John chapter 14, verses 6 through 7. St. John chapter 14, verses 6 through 7. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. That's what he said, because Jesus and the father are one and the same, the father, son, and the Holy Spirit. If, if, if you know Christ, if you let him in, then that means you have, you have the father on the inside of you too, because it says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He means Christ, the Holy Spirit. The Father, they're within you. You have that strength. That's why it says that you can do all things because you have his strength on the inside of you. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But we have to really know that. We really have to do that taste test that we talked about. This is a part of tasting so that we don't become bland and just feel like we're just doing things and we're, we're, just, we're just acquiring things and that, that we just have things because of what we you know, uh, because of something that we've done. No, no. The goodness of Jesus and even accepting him as Christ, what leads us to our good works and, and even the ability to share the gifts that he's given us. So from now on, you do, you do know him and have seen him. So he's telling his disciples in this particular text, if you, if you, uh, if you know me, you, you've, seen, you've seen the father. So as we conclude in um, verse 22, and then I'm going to just go back and, and talk, talk a little briefly about um, the other churches and then bring it together, um, since this is actually the conclusion of a series. So uh, in verse 22, in conclusion, is, um, is kind of concluding. Jesus sounds the alarm to each church whether it was good or bad or a combination of both. In some churches, the truth remains. He loves these churches even enough to, to provide his spiritual sound so they could see. So blinded eyes could be open to the state of the church. That's why he always wanted them to hear what he was saying to them. Um, we must take heed to the warnings to the churches and see if we ourselves today if we can see ourselves, if we can put ourselves in any of those churches positions, do, do we have any of those characteristics that, that are either, that are either good or even bad? Um, do we have some of these characteristics and, and what do we might, well, what can we might ask God to work on us with? What areas does he need to work on? Cause that's what this is for is to, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a actually a, a beautiful gift given to the church even today to show us, you know, what, what is it? What are some things that I can go back and work on? Where, where, where can this text take me back to cross reference with other texts in the Bible as we've done throughout this whole series? If you've been with us throughout this whole series to go back and try to see where I need to stand, what I need to do. And, and of course, it's not easy. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not something that you just, you just uh, say one, two, three, or, or turn around and, and, and it's done. No, that's not the way it works. It's, 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 it's all in. 
We have to be all in. We have to be one way, not struggling, and not moderate, not dull, but we have to have a passion and a true, genuine desire for work, the work of ministry and to be in a relationship with Christ. That's what he wants. That's his goal. He wants a relationship with his creation. He wants us to serve him. He wants us to honor him. He's not trying to, to browbeat us and make us live in a, in a world that he, a beautiful world that he created for us to be, to be bombarded with fear and depression and, and to be down, broke and busted and disgusted as we so hear sometimes. He doesn't want that for us. This is not a God that wants us to say, how do we know? How do we know that? Because he gives us plans. He makes crooked roads straight for us. He's our shepherd. He says he should supply all of our need according to his riches and glory. So that means if he supplies our need according to his riches and glory, it's far more better than what the world can offer. So, and it's not necessarily tangible things. Although he does give us tangible things and we glorify him for that. But he gives us those spiritual things, especially when we go through those spiritual, spiritual droughts. When we can't when we can't even breathe or keep our uh, we can't even we can't even taste. We can't even see. He opens up our eyes. He, he, he illuminates our taste buds so that we can taste so that we can have a desire to take him in even the more. So we must allow him to lead us into change, acknowledging him and letting him direct our paths on this Christian journey. We have so much to live for. Um, he has given us some gifts to equip us again, according to the measure of our faith. But we must be willing to yield to his will and to his way. So as we pull the, all the churches together, as we realize how um, the churches, the churches were, uh, we'll go back and I'm going to do a quick, a real brief overview and, and, and just, just say what each church, each church was and what it meant. So first of all, we went to the church of Ephesus, uh, going back to the first love. That means that he wanted them to, to rekindle that fire that might be going out, remaining faithful. He, he wanted them to, even though they're going through and they might have some poverty, he wants them to remain faithful. And, and most of the, the thread through each and every one of the churches is to remain faithful. It's the faith, the faith to remain um, um, Pergamum is, was a second church. Stay true to my name. They, they, they were true to his name, but they had some idolatrous ways. Um, the church in Thyatira, they tolerated that woman, uh, Jezebel. That was the third church. Um, the church at Sardis, they were uh, that dead, complacent church. They kind of stuck in, stuck in their, their one way of doing things. Um, the church in Philadelphia, this is the one where he did not have any complaint. Um, they didn't, uh, wait a minute, hold on. I skipped, I skipped, I skipped somewhere. Let's see. I skipped Smyrna. Smyrna remained, they remained faithful even in their, uh, even in their affliction. And that was two after Ephesus and then Pergamum, they stayed true to his name, uh, for fire tower. They, they tolerated that woman Jezebel five, the dead church, which was Sardis, uh, that complacent church. And then Philadelphia, uh, the sixth the sixth church was they did not deny God's name. He had nothing bad to say about them and he wanted them to remain faithful to him. And um, he also said that, that they would be vi victorious as they remain and they will definitely uh, receive their crown, but they must stay faithful to him. Um, and then the last church, of course, that's the one that we talked about tonight is the church in Laodicea, the lukewarm church. And um, though th this church is, is likened to, to me, um, even as I read it, it's kind of likened to that church at Sardis. They kind of had had the same the same faith level because they were complacent right here in the middle. They were they were, they, they were useless in the spirit. 
um, and we talked about that Sunday from the sermon too. You heard that Sunday. Um, but he wanted to, them to recognize that he wanted them to either be for him or against him one way or the other. Man cannot serve two masters. You can only have one. And our God is a jealous God. So we must remain faithful. So on tonight, as we conclude, let us not be complacent and become bland. Let us make a decision. This is a challenge for us. Let us make a decision that we are all in and it's nothing that we have done, but because of his grace and mercy, as we walk by faith and not by sight, realizing that we have a hope and glory that if we don't grow weary in well-doing, we will reap a harvest if we faint not. Again, we thank each and every one of you who shared with us on tonight. Um, we, we bless, we ask the blessings of God upon each and every one of your lives. And as we get ready to, um, to, to go on tonight, we just ask that you continue to pray ye one for another. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you for the wisdom and the will of your word. We ask right now that you would continue to strengthen us and keep us, Lord, as we as we have heard from all the seven churches, Lord. And if there's something that we need to repent of on tonight, we ask right now that you would touch our hearts and show it to us and reveal it to us, Lord, and help us to have a better walk and a closer walk with you, Lord, as we as we continue to unfold your word. Lord, we ask right now that you would continue to develop us into the Christians that you would have us to be. And Lord, continue to have mercy on our spirit, our soul, and even our body. Lord, we ask for, for refreshment, refinement. We pray for healing right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for comforter right now in the peace that surpasses all understanding. Now, Lord, we ask for your covering throughout the rest of this week. We continue to pray for that storm that's hovering out over the ocean. We ask right now that, Lord, everything be done according to your will. Lord, we ask you continue to keep Florida safe, North Carolina safe, and all the states or and surrounding areas that may be in its path. Lord, we ask right now that we continue to even see you even in the midst of storms. Lord, we glorify you and we lift you up. For us in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen, and amen. You all have a great night. And remember, love is the better way. Bye-bye now.